And they said, I know it. And look who you're surrounded with, all the stars. <laughs> Groucho Marx and Johnny Goodell, the whole gang. Oh, and Linda Marx there. What do you know? Groucho stands up. Now, uh, we really fooled you, didn't we, Harold? Well, I should say you did. I've never been so surprised in my life, Ralph. Your bowling ball with you. What'd you say, Groucho? Has he got, ask him if he's got his bowling ball. With you got your bowling ball? <laughs> no, I'm afraid I wouldn't know how to use it. You, you, you know, we could do 30 minutes with Groucho Marx and Harold Lloyd here, but we got to get going. You know, 27, that's I'm right. two minutes out of that year. <laughs> well, modest and unassuming, you've often said nobody's going to get me near that studio on Wednesday night. What? Ask him if he drives it as soda. Oh, shut up! Do you do drive it as soda? <laughs> use, well, no, he can't. Uh, well, his wife uses Hazel Bishop and Prowl. Well, uh, anyhow, that's... <laughs> Marx, this isn't your program, Groucho. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Groucho. Thank Every morning in the bathtub. Thank you, Groucho. This may be Groucho Marx's life, and we keep on, you can't tell. Hey, that's not a bad idea if we could ever get... Listen... I'll help you with that. <laughs> well, to fool you was a very, very difficult task. That's why we had to get your good friend Jim Calder here all the way from Milwaukee tonight just to try to get you to the Derby. Uh, isn't that right, Jim? That's right, Ralph. I called Harold from Milwaukee. It my home. Yes. I told him I was going to be in town for just two hours. Would he please meet me down at Bell Run Tool Stereo Service? Yeah. And we come up here at the Derby for a bite, and here we are. <laughs> oh, my. Well, that's... Uh, you, Ralph. I think you could get anybody. Well, what was the bait to get him? <laughs> Three-dimensional slide. Oh. You know, this old-time great movie ma man... All time, also a great said. photographer. Yes. Three-dimensional stereo. Uh, Very nice. That's true. That's just one of many, many of your accomplishments, <laughs> as we shall see. Well, now, look, we have a car outside, Harold, ready to rush you to the El Capitan Theater, where we'll recreate the story of one of the most beloved people in motion picture history. Say what goodbye to Groucho. What? What kind of oh, a car? We have a DeSoto waiting on. <laughs> <laughs> well, every morning, is that any good? Prell is fine, thank you. And it... I eat Prell for breakfast every fine, morning. Fine, Groucho. Come on, we're on our way. Here we come with... Without Groucho Marx, I'll have you know. <laughs> All right. Just before you got here, Harold, Bob, did you show the picture of uh, the little bit of safety last? Bob, you did? Uh, some of the uh, of that height was an illusion, but uh, you, not uh, a double, were actually uh, a number of stories off the ground, weren't you, Harold? Uh, yes. Uh, we worked on different buildings, Ralph. We, the last uh, was about uh, the highest we had here in Los Angeles. Yeah. About Ten or twelve stories, whatever it is, and uh, we worked on the actual buildings. We built platforms about story uh, below us, mm -hmm. but uh, we were actually taking a chance because the platforms didn't have any railings. Of course, the cameraman was taking a much chance. Oh, I, I don't know. I think you were taking a chance. It shows that not only did a, a star have to have uh, uh, bundles of courage, he had to have bushels of talent, or vice versa. And you had both, that's for sure, on and off the screen, as we're going to find out. This is your life. Harold Lloyd, come on and sit down here, boy. Away we go. <laughs> Say, we were lucky we made it up here so fast, you know. You know this is very familiar. I've been on this program. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we, were, we should give you a life membership to This Is Your Life. The future great comedian, you, Harold Clayton Lloyd, first see daylight without benefit of horn rim specs in Birchard, Nebraska, the son of Mr. and Mrs. J. Darcy Lloyd. You have an elder brother, Gaylord. All three have since passed away. In your childhood, Harold, your family moves about a great deal. What are some of the towns you lived in? Do you recall? Yes. Let's see. I lived in a little town called Pawnee. Another little town called uh, Beatrice. They didn't call it Beatrice. They called it Beatrice. Beatrice, yes. Uh, Nebraska. Omaha, that's right. Mm -hmm. Omaha, Nebraska. Denver, Colorado. Oh, we were a moving yes. family. We, <laughs> that's for sure. We really were a mobile group. We migrated around. In Denver, your father clerks in a shoe store. That's right. You were a, a poor boy. A great admirer of Mark Twain's, uh, Tom Sawyer. Very much so. Yes, indeed. I pulled a number of stunts. <laughs> yes, well, I was going to say, like Tom Sawyer, <laughs> yeah. you've retained, though, to this day, the spirit of eternal youth. And as a boy, as you say, you use some of Tom Sawyer's methods to get yeah. out of work. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> yes, Harold, do you remember how you used to get the neighborhood kids to clean up your backyard by promising to teach them magic tricks? You taught me how to hypnotize you. 
Now, I don't expect you to recognize that voice, Harold. You haven't no, heard it. No, he's talking about things that I yeah. know about. It's been about 50 years. Here from McLeod, California now, your Nebraska boyhood friend, Paul Heron. Oh, Paul yeah. Heron. There he is. It's a long time. Uh, long time. Yes, but you're speaking my language. Uh, so come on out nice here uh, so we can talk together. Uh, how did Harold teach you to hypnotize him, Paul? <laughs> uh, we were 10 or 12 years old, and yeah. he told me how to give him the big eye and the big stare and the focus, focus signals. I remember and I wouldn't come out of it, wasn't that it? Uh, <laughs> snap my fingers to bring him out. Yeah. And you tried it on Harold, is that it? Sure. What happened? Yeah. Uh, well, he snapped it. his fingers, and uh, and I wouldn't come out. Oh. So he was in a terrible fix, because <laughs> he, he got me, hypnotized me, but he couldn't bring me out. <laughs> I, I had to do he was pretty all, upset about the whole I thing. I had to do a lot of capers around the yard for about 30 minutes. That's so. right. You certainly oh. did. Then, then I snapped my fingers. <laughs> and then he, but he must have uh, driven you crazy for a while. Yeah, but finally you decided you'd had enough fun with me. That's right. Came out. A budding <laughs> comedy sense. had me going. You, uh, yes, I did. That's That's right. A budding comedy that sense well. that someday is to flower into great talent, Harold. Thank you, Paul Heron. Thank you so much. So, see you later. Thank you. 1902, you see your first movie, The Great Train Robbery, but the flickers are only a passing fad. Your main interest is the stage, Harold Lloyd. You even write little plays, and with a cast of friends, you act them out in the backyard. Summers and after school, like uh, many another kid, you get all kinds of jobs. You didn't you? Yes, I did. Uh, yes, now, I did. between the time you're 11 and 18, you play many small roles in various stock companies. In 1911... An accident and the flip of a coin decide your future. You go to New York, you come to the coast. That's right. You're in Omaha, Nebraska. Your That's father's right. by now working for the Singer Sewing Machine Company. That's right. But then... Lloyd said, come to California. We came to California, and I uh, came out here. I had, uh, I had a friend of mine who was... Now, uh, so that you won't jump our yes. uh, story, Harold, because yes. goodness knows no one knows your story better than you. Your father actually... Uh, got into an accident, didn't he? And yes, it was he the, did. the money from that settlement that amounted to a couple That's of right. thousand dollars yes. that uh, could take you somewhere else. As you say, you were a moving family. I think so. And so between the, two and three thousand uh, dollars that he, he had. He wanted to go to the East, New York. Uh, well, he didn't care, really. Yeah. Uh, he was perfectly willing to go either place. So the flip of the coin brought you to it San actually did Diego. That. It really did. And of course, there you're only 125 miles away from Hollywood. That's right. You finish high school and. You continue. Acting roles are scarce, though. One day you're down to your last five cents. You're living on an apartment house roof. <laughs> what were you living in, Harold? Up well, they the built uh, four or five of these uh, just little... They were made out of cardboard, I really think, and uh, but you got them very cheaply, and uh, they're big enough to put a bed in. That was about all. Sort of a, so a it was right tent up on top type of the roof. Thing, yes, that it, it was almost a tent. I remember putting a lot of college pennants up in there. That's all I had around the <laughs> wall. Uh, you decide to give Los Angeles a try after well, this. Unable to get enough work in the theater, you reluctantly apply for jobs as a film extra at Universal. I know how tough it was to get a job in pictures. I was an extra man myself at that <laughs> yeah. time, Harold. Yeah. Hi, Harold. No need asking you who that <laughs> no. is. The producer, director, creator of the great Our Gang comedies on film, now head of one of Hollywood's top TV film studios, your good friend, Hal Roach. Here he is, Harold. Good to see you, You know, these two guys, you think that Groucho and Harold could have gone for an hour, a half hour. These guys could go for two hours, I'm sure, oh, with stories. How did you movie extras get jobs in those early days, Hal? Oh, we used to stand around out in front of the studio with another gang of fellas, hoping the assistant director would give us a nod. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, how much was an extra paid in those days? Oh, I think he got about $3 a day, didn't he? Huh? <laughs> yes, that's what started. Then later on, we got very plutocrats. We got $5 a day. Oh, some well, days. Living. You some days get two or three days a week. You how know, did you get the good. assistant director's eye out there? In the uh, that was very difficult. It was hard to get into the studio to start with. Of course, that was pre hell. <laughs> but uh, one day I had to even put on a makeup. How's that? I'd, uh, well, I saw the different actors. They didn't uh, challenge them at the gate going through if they had a makeup on. Excuse me. I know you were an expert in makeup because well, you were trained as a boy yeah. in makeup. So I put a makeup on and walked right on through the door. They thought I was working. <laughs> That's the way it is. <laughs> now, <laughs> look, you saw this man go from $3 a day to over a million a year. How did he take this change? Ralph, uh, with all of the actors that I've been associated with, 
This fellow had less temperament than any that I ever knew. If you'd go out to his beautiful home today in Beverly Hills, you'd probably see some of the same fellows that he used to know when he was getting $3 a day, and they'd all be calling him Speedy. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Hal Roach. I can Roach. say the same thing for this fellow, believe me. <laughs> He's one of Hollywood's all-time greats, too, isn't he? Thank you, Hal Roach. Thank you, Hal. 1917. In this year, you create what you call the glasses character, the character with the horn-rimmed glasses. How, how did you get the idea for the glasses character, Harold? You... I got it from uh, a, what was it, a feature picture. It was a minister. Mm -hmm. A minister, uh, he wore uh, these horn-rimmed glasses, and uh, he, uh, he was one of these kinds that belied his appearance. You thought that he was uh, very dignified and uh, strictly to the cloth, but he was a go-getter, mm -hmm. and uh, it appealed to me, the, the reversity of character. Yes. And I wanted to do it as a studious character. Well, now, the parson was the character, I think. The parson the, but the, the parson character. wasn't wearing he horn, horn rim glasses. Yes, he wore Oh, rim. did he wear the horn yes. rim? And, and, uh, and it, was a, a, it had nothing to do with comedy. It was a, it was a dramatic picture. And you decided, of course... And the... I, it was with, uh, with the glasses, and uh, uh, I, I thought that that would give you a studious uh, uh, appearance. Of course, they were coming in vogue then, too. Or, yes. or actually, you're the guy that, that, that really put well, them into uh, vogue, you might yes, say. Yes, I don't think that... I think he just uh, uh, had him as a character. I believe he had him. I'm not sure whether I got the... Uh, but it was his reversal of character of being a go-getter. That gave you gave the, idea. the idea. And for the first time in motion picture history, a comedian, you, Harold Lloyd, does not wear an odd makeup, mustache, or funny clothes. He looks like the average, recognizable American youth. That was the reason I did it, Ralph, because uh, you could have romance in the picture. You could be believed as the boy next door. Right. And, and this is the Harold Lloyd that America is to take to its heart in Grandma's Boy... A sailor-made man, why worry, the freshman, Milky Way, and a host of other great films. Who can ever forget? But we're back in 1919 when your leading lady, B.B. Daniels, decides to become a dramatic actress for Cecil B. DeMille. You and Hal Roach over here look for a blonde to contrast with B.B.'s brunette beauty. Harold and Hal Roach saw me in a picture with Bryant Washburn and wired me to come and see them. Oh, those wives. Oh, sneaky. Uh, sneaky. The lovely actress oh. who became your leading lady, Harold, not only in pictures but for life, Mildred Davis, Mrs. <laughs> Harold Lloyd, Mid, as they call her. Here's Mid. <laughs> Going out shopping, huh? Oh. Come on, Mid, you sit over here next to your famous husband. <laughs> Oh, dear. She said, he's going to hit me right over the head. I never thought you could do it, Ralph. I know. You said it. After B.B. Daniels' uh, party, you said, oh, Ralph, you can never get me. You very nearly didn't get that acting job with Harold. Isn't that so, Miss? Well, that's right, it Ralph. Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to high school, and so I wanted to look older, and I bought a new wardrobe, uh -huh. including a large hat with a willow plume down there. Oh, dear. Uh, well, did you like her that way, Harold? You didn't. Oh, yeah. well, uh, she looked no, a little we old, made it. We made her, yes, yeah, she did. Uh, we wanted her nice, uh, just as she was, and she wanted to be much older, so... Uh, but you and Hal Roach... You got that wardrobe You decide to her. take a chance and hire Mildred. The public applauds your choice. They accept and love her, and in a far more personal way, so do you. Now, in the years ahead of you, Harold Lloyd, you're to undergo in real life some of the same elements of danger and laughter you brought to the picture screens of the world. Uh, we'll see that on our screen in a few moments. Now, back to This Is Your Life. Harold Lloyd, great comedian, one of the most truly beloved people in the film capital. August 24th, 1919 is a day you'll never forget, Harold, because on that day you nearly lose your eyesight and your life. You're making some publicity gag photographs of the studio. You're being... Photograph lighting a cigarette with a phony trick bomb. What, what happened, Harold? Well, the bomb was, uh, was taken out of a desk that should never... It was broken into by one of the gag men who wanted to get a lot of props for to do it. Went down to a photograph gallery uh, called Witzel's. I don't know whether they're still in business or not. And we were making all these gag pictures. Sure. And this one I was to light the cigarette off of the wig of the bomb. The only thing is that the smoke kept blowing in my face. And I kept following it down. Now, this was in a, what we use as big paper mache bombs, but this real bomb had been put inside. Oh, yes. Sir. And as it got almost to the, uh, to the bottom of the bomb, uh, then I realized that it wouldn't make a good picture. So the only thing that saved my life was that I was going to say, it's no good now. So as I said, it, and as I lowered it here, 
the bomb went off. Went right straight up and blew a big hole about that big in the ceiling. And, uh... Blinded uh, and stunned, your face bleeding, you're taken to the Methodist Hospital. Your career is over, you think. At first, of course, you're depressed. Then your natural optimism takes over. What did you think, Harold, as you lay in that bed? Well, I, I said, well, now, what, what am I going to be able to do? I guess maybe I can direct, maybe I can write, I can uh, do something in the theater. But uh, uh, I felt that the career was over. Of course, for about three months, they weren't sure That's right. uh, whether I was going to see or not. The uh, doctors think you lose your right eye, but then that eye is also saved. That's right. Is that they, right? They thought one eye was gone. Yes, yes, I can remember the first thing. It was the Motion Picture Herald, a trade magazine, about three months later that they held. They said, can you see anything? I said, I see a red book. Oh, and I told him what it was. They said, he's going to get his other eye back. And both eyes were all right. The yes. scars on your face heal completely. You go back to pictures, and the world is richer for your return. <laughs> February 10th, 1923, Harold, you held her hand just like that. You and Mildred sign a lifelong contract, beginning a most happy marriage that has lasted 32 years. Mildred retires from the screen to star in your home. Mm -hmm. Adding to your happiness have been three fine children, Gloria, Peggy, and Harold Jr., just out of the Air Corps, who himself has a promising career as an actor. And here are the kids, right here. We want to see the faces because they're just <laughs> handsome and beautiful there. Line up there behind uh, Mom and Dad. Uh, there, a five-star Harold Lloyd feature, eh? <laughs> As the years pass, Harold, you and your pictures, many of which you produce and direct yourself, contribute richly to the laughter of America. In 1947, you make a Preston Sturgis picture called Mad Wednesday. Now, there was a character in that picture with you who played an important role. I know you recognize that voice. Bad, Harold. It's Jackie the Lion, yes. Don't tell me he's here. Yes, he's here. What kind of stunts did you do with uh, Jackie and Mad Wednesday? Oh, I never thought I'd ever do stunts like that. I'm you hung by his that. neck, you know, and all that yeah. stuff. Harold, for the sake of all concerned, we yeah. won't invite Jackie to the yeah. party in your honor I think after that's the a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. You know, Jackie's teeth are still very good, as you really want to know. When, did, uh, when, uh, when you did your stunts with that lion in Mad Wednesday, Harold, you rehearsed over and over until every stunt was perfect because you are a true perfectionist. Yes, we did. Uh, we had a lot of funny ones. I was supposed to lead him into... Ralph the... Harold proved that point several years ago when we played the word game at Paramount Studios. <laughs> one of your very best friends and one of Hollywood's most famous makeup artists, Wally Westmore. Here's Wally! <laughs> Take up all you <laughs> What's the word game you mentioned, Wally? What is this word game? You well, folks uh, really got keep secrets. A group of us played this uh, word game with about 10 or 12 of us, and uh, we had to form five letter words horizontally and vertically. Yeah. And then we totaled a score, and the one that had the lowest score had to buy the, all of the lunches. Who usually got stunned with the lunches? Well, Harold paid for quite a few of them. I <laughs> sure did. But being the perfectionist he is, he wanted to master the word game, so he uh, hired two secretaries and uh, <laughs> had every English word in uh, English and French copied. Every five-letter word in Every five-letter word, yes. And oh, I four stayed, and three-letter words. And stayed up until four or five in the morning <laughs> studying them and, and uh, memorizing them. And from then on, he never <laughs> lost a game. And, 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 and nor a lunch. Time. Thank you, Wally <laughs> Westmore. You'll see yeah. Harold at the party you right all right. <laughs> you can take it from me. <laughs> yes, whatever you attempt, your determination carries you to the top, Harold. When you take up handball for recreation, you become a championship class handball player. As a bowler, you bowl a number of perfect games. No mean feat. You're a painter of stature, a nationally known color expert who has invented a color palette for artists. You're an expert with a microscope. There's always a young, eager outlook for new interests, and you're good in all of them. Your great contribution to motion pictures was recognized in 1952 by the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences, when you were awarded a special Oscar inscribed to Harold Lloyd, Master Comedian, Good Citizen. And just last week, you were presented with the George Eastman House Medal of Honor for distinguished contributions to the art of motion pictures, 1915 to 1925. And there's another all-important activity of yours, Harold. You've been a Shriner for 31 years, oh, haven't you? Yeah. In 1949, you were Imperial Potentate, the highest of the officers, the highest office in the Shrine. In that year, Oh, how many speeches did you make to Masonic Shrine Temples on behalf of the 17 well, Shrine Hospitals for Crippled Children? During the year, I visited about 130 cities. And in those speeches, what did you say about helping children, uh, crippled children, uphill? Well, I said you can't 
uh, help a crippled child up the hill without getting closer to the top yourself. You raise vast amounts of money for these hospitals. Yeah, Mr. Lloyd helped raise money for the, for the Shriners Hospital for crippled children where I was. Well, you met this little girl a few years ago when she was a patient in a Shrine Hospital, and here she is, Miss Patty Lee Britton, the sweetest little girl. Well, how about this, Patty? Come on, girl. I want to thank you, Mr. Lloyd, for what you did for me. It's because of you that I can now walk and play like other little girls. I couldn't when you first met me. Oh, yeah. This is your life. Harold Lloyd, star comedian, star humanitarian. Like the Tom Sawyer you admired, you've become an American institution. 700. Well, Harold, we have so many things to give for your future. Uh, we're just going to skip to the uh, Shriners Hospital for Crippled Children here in Los Angeles. They'll have a 16-millimeter Bell & Howell projector to play films on. Also, an RCA Victor Mark I High Fidelity Victrola phonograph and combination tape recorder in your honor. The shrine itself, of which you're a past imperial potentate, has designated for tonight's occasion a signal and richly deserved honor. In each of the 17 Shriners Crippled Children's Hospital in North America, there's a gold book in which there's a perpetual memorial to men who've done unusually outstanding and meritorious works in behalf of these hospitals. Your name goes in that all over the country. This is your life. Harold Lloyd, thank you, good night, and God bless.